berbuat swaha, tat savitur varenyan, bargo deva siaji mahi, jiu yona prachodaya. Many blessings to the universe. Thank you, Professor Regina. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ka Homeopathy Study Group Pro Bono Webinar, hosted by Kavita Holistic Approach. I would like to take the privilege to say that our CA study group is the first homeopathy pro bono study group from the United States of America, which formed to unite world renowned practitioners spanning the globe. CA's mission and vision are very unique to inspire young homeopaths, mentor, provide excellence for educational purposes using holistic approaches via webinars. We provide professional continuing educational homeopathic credits for practitioners. We follow the principles of classical homeopathy and invite speakers for each and accredited webinars. We value and treasure the human collective as our honorable peers. We provide merit certificates for spreading the light of homeopathy worldwide while celebrating stage four cancer survivors through our book inspirational talks. These webinars are for educational purposes only and see expert homeopath for treatment. This is Kavita Kukunur, board certified homeopath from Michigan, USA. President and CEO of Kavita Holistic Approach, founder and director of Ka Homeopathy Study Group. I am outreach coordinator of CHC PR committee, encouraging homeopaths to become CHC certified. I am member of Kevin Friendly Foundation, a non-profit organization that helps to support people in greater needs in India. I thank our homeopathy study group team for their continuous support. This webinar is moderated by our family, Dr. Sveta Singh, Chief Administrator, Dr. Regina Rianelli. It is being recorded as we speak. Since many registered and unable to join Zoom, we are live on Facebook. This webinar is one hour with one CU of HNS CPD educational credits that can be used for CHC recertification, which is due November 30th, and NASH recertification, which is due in December. And all applicable to, uh, this is applicable to participants who attended live webinar on Zoom and Facebook and fills the evaluation chart form, which is provided in the chat at the end of the webinar. If you are unable to log into Zoom and watching on Facebook, then please email us at castatigroup at gmail.com today itself, which is November 15th, 2020. So you can receive your certificate in a couple of days. Voice to support homeopathy. Our friends at North Americans for Homeopathy Choice submitted a petition to the FDA to protect homeopathy. We need your help. It will just take two minutes. Our goal is 100,000 comments by December 2nd, 2020. Currently, we have 16,000 plus. Thank you to all those who supported this petition. We will provide link in chat to comment. It is stomach is management of thyroid disorders with homeopathy. We have very good homeopathic remedies that address several disturbances of thyroid and when applied principles of homeopathy, we see great improvement and success. Our honorable speaker for today's session is Karen Allen. And at the end, we will have CHC President Sheetal Tiwari, who speaks about CHC certification. I got my CHC in 2007 and felt that getting CHC certified is very important as it recognizes you as a certified and professional homeopath in USA. With inspiration from Dr. Watsala Sperling, my spiritual guru, I folded my true life experience and struggle I underwent to get CHC certified in the form of book beyond the limits a challenge to prove oneself the proceeds of the book goes to charity we already made a video on importance of certification from chc experts like samantha Canboy, tammy Harden, laurie grassman dan ullman karen allen and many more it's a great privilege to introduce our honorable speaker karen allen who is an experienced integrated healthcare pro practitioner nationally certified in classical homeopathy she began practicing in 1994, under the California Business and Professional Code of Ethics, with great success, she completed her Bachelor's of Science from Texas University. She also worked at American Medical College of Homeopathy at the Phoenix Institute of Herbal Medicine and Acupuncture, and adjunct faculty in homeopathic philosophy. For the past decade, her work has been primarily focused on endocrine, reproductive, and fertility issues. She offers biochemics, gematherapy, counseling, hypnotherapy, botanical 
in nutritional supplements and dietary therapies to her clients. She teaches at several conferences and schools across North America and have authored two widely used homeopathic textbooks. She is the director of Trinity Health Club, providing homeopathic services, classes, and many more. There's so much to say about Karen Allen, and we welcome Karen to our webinar. Kavita, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, I want to echo two things that Kavitha said. I want to welcome Sheetal and emphasize my own uh, value for the CCH credential. Many things that the Trinity Health Hub is doing and the National Telehealth Clinic that we're opening would not be possible without an accredited credential. And so we stand on the shoulders of people who had huge vision for the last two and a half decades have been working on this. And I'm grateful to, to Sheetal, to Samantha Convoy, to all of the people who have been working so hard, to Anne McKay, who worked so diligently to get that credential completed, leading the team that was able to complete it. And there's just no way to overstate how important the accreditation of the CCH credential is as far as allowing all of us to become part of the US's national healthcare workforce. So hooray for that. And I also want to ask again, I signed the petition for the FDA and you know we want there to be a good working relationship between the homeopathic community and the oversight bodies in all ways. I believe that this petition is an important step in creating that really good working relationship. And um, so please, it only takes two minutes. Please be brave. Please put in your address. Please sign up on that petition. It makes a difference. Every single person makes a difference. Okay, so. Thank you, Kate. And uh, I am Thank going so to much, go Kevin. ahead. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Yes, yeah? please. Okay. All right. I want to welcome. It is so good to see so many of you that I see in some of my classes. Hello, Alan. Hello, Gina. Hello, Dr. Hira. Hello, so many of you who, you know, it would take me so long to call out everybody's names, but I just want to thank you for getting up and spending your Sunday morning or Sunday evening, or Monday morning, wherever it is where you are, you are taking time that you could be spending polishing your toenails. And instead, you are investing in yourself, in your practice, and in every client that you are going to see. And I'm grateful that you are that committed to building the homeopathic profession. So thank you all for joining me here. We're going to be talking about thyroid, a really common complaint. And many of you work with people who are hyperthyroid, hypothyroid, um, managed thyroid on medications, people who have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And the, all of this disturbance of thyroid function has a downstream impact, has an upstream implication. And there are a lot of things that we can do as homeopaths to help that. And one of the things that I'm going to be presenting today is something that was accepted as a common idea back in the 1890s. It was a way that we viewed homeopathy and viewed thyroid function 130 years ago, 120 years ago, that we really don't think of or talk about now. But it becomes very important when we have those cases that don't just respond well to calcarea iodatum or spongia or sepia or some of the really common, wonderful uh, polycrests that are doing great things for homeopathy. So we're going to be capturing that today. Now, you don't have to worry about writing down anything that I say, the recording. I believe Kavita is going to make it available. And also this document, you will be able to download. That's correct, Kavita? Yes, we will provide the recording and the document along with the evaluation form, which they have to submit to get the certificate. Because November, 
N is the CHC certification, which we are focusing and in uh, December NASH. So it will be applicable for both of them. Thank you, Karen. Oh, good, 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 good. All right. So what are we doing today? We're going to talk through what's happening with thyroid issues. And when somebody uses the terms autoimmune and lymphocytic, what does that really mean? We're going to talk about concepts of systemic inflammation and oxidative stress. And then we're going to introduce this concept from Von Gravogel, from one of the old, old, old homeopaths about oxygenoid constitution and what that means. And we're going to give some basic ideas of how this can apply to your work when you're doing chronic care with clients. And the support for their thyroid may be leaning toward this instead of that in the differential in your chronic care. And then we're going to do the proverbial case example. Those of you who have sat in a lot of my classes have I, I just teach from my failed cases all the time. So all of us run into the wall sometimes where we have something that doesn't work and then we have to back up and figure out what does work. So we're going to be doing some cases. All right, let's just frame how important this is. Um, globally, we have four to 5% of the population in some kind of diagnosed thyroid disorder. Uh, it's estimated, depending on whose estimates you use, that another 4% or up to 15% have disorders that are not diagnosed. So they're viewed as subclinical. So this means that up to 20% of the global population has thyroid disruption. That's huge. That's one in every five people you know. That's a lot. And it's worse for people who are elders and another really vulnerable population are people who are just past delivery with their baby. Postpartum thyroiditis is a huge issue. And we talked about this on the hub on Friday morning on the differential diagnosis for endocrine disorders. And uh, Kavita, if it's okay with you, I can pass you some additional documentation to help recognize that specific thing. Now, long-term, the idea around how do we deal with thyroid has been, let's support people with iodine. And iodine is an important factor, but as many of you know, it's not enough. If it was just iodine, we would not be seeing potentially 20% of the, the population globally dealing with this. So let's look at where we have most of the issues of overt hypothyroidism, people who are under um, functioning in the thyroid. Now we have to ask, is it really because these are the places that it exists or is it that these are the places that can report? These are the places that have the diagnostic capacity and can report. I, so I just want to put this out here to emphasize this is a global issue. And it doesn't matter whether you are a homeopath in Bolivia or Brazil or Australia or India or Afghanistan, wherever you are, this is likely to be an issue. And so you want to be able to recognize it and deal with it in both an acute and lesional and chronic way. We want to be robust in our capacity. And this is the hyperthyroidism. So for some reason, Brazil is really high on this end. Interesting. Okay, so how do we deal with this? How do I deal with it? How do you deal with it? What are we all doing already about this? Well, we're doing chronic care. And when there is a strong affinity between a well-selected chronic remedy and the function of the thyroid and the endocrine system in general, then a lot of times it'll just sort itself out. And some of the leaders in this area are the snake venoms, 
the metabolic minerals. A lot of the snake venoms are uh, the remedies that are hot, like lachesis is a warm blooded remedy. Uh, we're gonna see hyperthyroid affinity in that remedy. Some of the snake venoms are chili remedies. We're gonna see some hypothyroid affinity in a lot of those. Metabolic minerals, everything that is used as a metabolite in the body, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, iodine, all of the halides, which brings us to the C remedies. You know, the halides are the next to the last column in the periodic table. And they have all this information um, that stimulates the, I don't know if I could call it information. They have an, a push on the endocrine system that supports it well. So we have a lot of remedies that deal with halides, all the bromides and iodines and fluoratums that are, and muriaticums that are really strong in their capacity to help the body repair itself when there's a thyroid issue. So some of the really common remedies that are used a lot, spongia, Think about spongia, guys. This is a sea sponge. It sits there in the ocean. It gets all the halides that are in ocean water built into itself. And then it gets dried out. It gets made into a remedy. It's like a halide nutritional polycrest. And so if I just had one remedy, if I had to choose just one thing, it would probably be spongia. Spongia given in 3X, multiple times daily, 6X, 12X, those kinds of potencies over a short term, three to six weeks, can do a massive intervention in thyroid. And I know many of you guys are already doing this. Sepia also has that ocean halide water built into it. So does aqua marina, which is potentized seawater. So does silica marina. So these things are ones that all of us are using to help with thyroids in general. The halides help with the dysbiosis of the iodine metabolism. So strontium, kalite iodatum, arsenicum iodatum, calcarea iodatum, again, a lot of these used in low X potencies. All the fluoride salts, calcarea fluoratum, calcarea bromium, bromide, and all of the organ supports that help with the endocrine system. We also have the option of using hormonal SAR codes. What if the thyroid problem came on after some kind of a hormonal insult? So uh, somebody had a Depo-Provera shot, somebody took a Plan B pill, somebody uh, had an IVF procedure, somebody had a miscarriage or a fright or a shock or a head injury. All of these things can be things where we may want to give an intercurrent dose along with whatever we are working with in terms of chronic constitutional care. It may be as simple as an intercurrent dose of a hypothalamus 12C or anterior pituitary 6C once a week for six weeks, helping their chronic remedy to repair the endocrine function. Another group that is, I think, underutilized but very useful in thyroid function is the imponderables. Sol and Luna, which are made from sunlight and moonlight, have been in our Materia Medica for over 100 years. Spectrum, which is a newer remedy and red and blue as colors. Spectrum is the remedy that is made from the prismatically spit, split beam of light that makes a rainbow. Um, and that is shined into a beaker of alcohol and then it's potentized. And when people in particular have Hashimoto's or some other kind of autoimmune related thyroid dysfunction. This is a very powerful ally. So these are things that homeopaths are using now and they work well and they help us a lot. And sometimes we end up pounding our head against the wall because we've got a case where these 
common tools that we're using don't help. So we have to ask ourselves, what if it's really not a thyroid problem? What if we are, we have some, you know, the way that people talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS is not about the ovaries. It is about the endocrine system. So Hashimoto's thyroiditis would make us think it's about the thyroid. It's called chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, but it is part of the spectrum of autoimmune thyroid diseases that has a whole series of things. And it's named after a Japanese surgeon who first found this in the early 1900s and he called it struma, which we will recognize from our old homeopathic literature. This is a term that we see, struma lymphomatosa. So the antibodies bind to the TSH receptors and then the body just can't metabolize the tools that it's using to implement thyroid function. So autoimmune means that there's a disease that's caused by antibodies that are produced against substances that should be seen as friends. They're natural things in the body instead of, you know, fighting enemies. And a lymphocyte is a factor included in the blood. It's a, a cell that is about a quarter of our white blood cells. And it includes B cells, which are created by the thymus gland. Um, and T cells, which are created here in the thymus gland. And Hashimoto's disease is a chronic inflammation because these antibodies are attacking the thyroid and they can cause it to swell and they can cause it to create scar tissue. Now the issue is local, but the indicators for it are systemic. The issue is the terrain, not the locus of the thyroid. So I just have to ask, how, you know, if, if we can say, yes, this is an autoimmune issue and the thyroid is being attacked, what else is being attacked? Really, is it likely that we're going to see somebody with Hashimoto's thyroiditis where there are no other possible disruptions in the lymphatic system in the autoimmune sphere? To me, it seems quite unlikely that we would see that. Okay, so what are the things that trigger or amplify autoimmune issues? Environmental toxins, diet, oxidative stress, which is something that we hear a lot in the literature. Oxidative metabolic processes create these free radicals that go and attack healthy cells and damage things. And then we've got chronic systemic inflammation that contributes to all kinds of autoimmune disorders, which many of you are working with. Okay, so how did the old homeopaths deal with this? How did they deal with this before? Remember that, that Hashimoto diagnosed this in 1912. He created this definition, but it was happening before that. It wasn't like it came into existence just when he found it. So let's look at how old homeopaths viewed this. Von Gravogel is an, a, uh, one of our past homeopathic masters who really looked at what are the large swaths of terrain that all of us are working with. And he came up with three different categories. One of them was too great a percentage of water. And this is hydrogenoid constitution. And those of you who have been in classes where we've talked about gout and uric acid diathesis and the focus on psychosis class and things like that, all that is hydrogenoid constitution. And then there's two great and oxidation of the blood. This was his second category. And he called this an oxygenoid constitution. 
And then there's too slow a oxidation of the blood. And he called this carbonitrogenoid. Okay. Now we can sort of propagate hydrogenoid. It's not exactly equivalent, but we can kind of say this is the same as psychotic miasm. And oxygenoid constitution is kind of the same as tubercular miasm. And carbonitrogenoid is kind of the same as soric miasm. Now they're not exact one-to-one -one correspondences, but it's an easy way for you to think of them, okay? Are you guys using these? In your practice, do you, do you work with these concepts? So let's look at what the indicators, according to Van Vogel, what the indicators of oxygenoid constitution is. First, it's people who tend to have a slender or slight body. And we might think of this as a phosphoric constitution. You know, those people with long fingers and they're tall and lean. A second aspect is aggravation by change of weather, but the aggravation happens primarily during the change. These aren't those people who say, oh, I can tell that a storm is coming in because my knee is hurting. My old football injury hurts in the three days before a storm. So this is actually during the change. This isn't after the storm has hit and you're in the, the later shift. This is when the barometric, barometric pressure is going up and down. There is an amelioration during snowfall and rain. Okay, how weird is this? How common really is it that people are better in rainy environments? I mean, we know that as a keynote of causticum, right? But it's not such a common thing. And then the last indicator is that there is some kind of issue with the blood. Hysteria, which he, it, the way that von Gervogel uses this word, you can translate it instead of hysterical and kind of crazy, you can translate it into uterus related, which means endocrine, hormonal. When we take his use of that word and we bring it into the year 2020, it means hormonally disrupted. And then chlorosis and hemorrhage and diseases of the sexual apparatus. Okay, so some of you who have been in my classes will have heard me talk about a functional triad of the thyroid, the liver, and the uterus. The thyroid has a lot of activity about regulation of um, normal, healthy homeostasis. The liver is required, a healthy liver is required because it activates and metabolizes the signals that the thyroid sends out. And then the uterus is downstream from the actions of the liver because the liver, when it's distressed is not able to balance estrogen, progesterone, other endogenous hormones very well. And anywhere in that triad, if the, the uterus is disturbed, sometimes we'll see disruption in the liver and the thyroid. If the thyroid is disturbed, we're likely to see issues with the liver and the uterus. So all three of those are related. And when he is talking here about oxygenoid constitution and we see diseases of the sexual apparatus, we're talking about reproduction function disruption. And for many of you who are working with clients who are trying to get pregnant, they will have been coached that they need their thyroid working really well. They don't want their thyroid sluggish and off the high end of normal in terms of TSH or other findings if they're trying to get pregnant. So thyroid is a really important factor in reproductive function and diseases of the sexual apparatus. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, does weather apply to autoimmune functions? And I can send some additional reference documents for Kavita so that you guys will be able to download those. Research shows that there is a correlation between fibromyalgia pain 
and changes in barometric pressure and temperature and humidity. And rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and Sjogren's are all documented as having reaction to changes in weather condition. So what this tells us is that autoimmune... Hi, can somebody put themselves on mute, please? Thank you. Um, so autoimmune conditions are related to weather disruptions. So this confirms that we are in oxygenoid constitution. And he also talks about chlorosis. So this is a term that we see in our old literature where the old homeopaths used this term for people who had tuberculosis. Remember that oxygenoid constitution is roughly equivalent to tubercular miasm where people kind of run too hot, too fast, bleed a lot. And the uh, for women who have any form of anemia, uh, either their red blood cells aren't being manufactured very well, or they've got spleen disruption so that too many of their red blood cells are being taken out of commission unnecessarily, or they've got really heavy menstrual periods and they're bleeding out too much of their blood. All of those things, the anemic terrain is part of chlorosis. Now chlorosis, oh, the other one is thalassemia, which is an inherited disorder where the red blood cells just aren't able to carry as much oxygen. So these people tend to be under uh, oxygenated. They are in this oxygenoid disrepair. Now, chlorosis means kind of greenish, like chlorophyll in a plant. And it applied to people who didn't have enough red blood cells and they didn't look pink. They didn't look a healthy color. They looked kind of sallow, yellowy, greenish skin. And so when you see chlorosis anywhere in Materia Medica, you can assume that there could be an affinity between that remedy and oxygenoid constitution. Anything with tubercular miasm associated with it, you can assume it's related to oxygenoid constitution. Anything with thalassemia, okay? And what about diseases of the sexual apparatus? Well, women with Hashimoto's thyroiditis miscarry two to three times as often as women without uh, antibodies and presence of antibodies during the first trimester of pregnancy is a very consistent predictor of postpartum thyroiditis. So we're showing that we know from our research now a whole lot of stuff that von der Vogel didn't know, but confirms what he had to say. So what do we do with all that? I mean, hooray, it's interesting, but how do we implement it? How do we actually bring this to action with a client that's not getting better from all those things that we talked about at the beginning. Well, we want to look for remedies that have patterns of low thyroid function. And remember thyroid liver uterus triad. So we want remedies that have an affinity for the endocrine system, for the liver, for the uterus. We want something with an immune affinity with the lymph, an affinity to working with the lymph, with the spleen, with the thymus. Now, in Chinese medicine, the spleen's job is to hold on to the blood. The spleen's job is to hold on to the blood. So when you have a client who has hemorrhagic menstrual periods, or who is, you know, they, they get very easy bruising, they cut themselves and the wound won't stop bleeding. You need to be looking, is there spleen weakness for this person? Can I find a remedy for this person that can either provide organ support for the spleen as an adjunct to my well-selected chronic remedy? Or can I look to see, does my chronic remedy actually have an affinity for the spleen? Is it the best match to help this weak link for this person? Look in the remedies that you're giving. Let's say that you've taken a case of somebody and they've got a big full case. They've got the usual array of whatever is wrong with people and they have a thyroid issue. 
And as you complete your analysis and you're doing a differential diagnosis, this is where you can be looking, oh, is the liver thyroid uterus triad represented in this remedy better or worse than this remedy as you're choosing in your differential? Is there a spleen affinity? Is there a lymphatic affinity? Does it say in this remedy over here, it's an oxygenoid constitution remedy? Is it associated with cancer miasm or tubercular miasm? Cancer and tubercular miasms are the most vulnerable to hormonal insult and the most likely to be related to oxygenoid constitution. Do these remedies show that there's aggravation from weather changes? You know, and there's some remedies where this is really written up large, rhododendron, you know, it's a huge keynote. Although we might see cases of rhododendron where it isn't there. These are all the other things you can look at to say, is rhododendron in oxygenoid constitution? And then blood dyscrasias. This is why we end up in the land of the snake venoms because there are so many blood disturbances there. So who are our therapeutic leaders to consider? In my experience, most of the time when I'm trying to work with someone where the primary constraint is the thyroid, if I have a differential between a meta metabolic mineral like calcium, magnesium, um, strontium, iodine, phosphorus, one of the calis, anything that's used as a metabolite versus something else. If in doubt, in a case like this, I would be more likely to go with the mineral kingdom remedy because I know it has a stronger affinity for all those things we just talked about, except rust tox. Rust tox is like the poster child of oxygenoid constitution. And it's a strong remedy associated with tubercular miasm. It has the restlessness. It's got a lot of features that are very important. Okay, ferrum fos and ferrum iodatum. At where you've got a good chronic remedy, it's helping with a lot of things, but it's not touching the thyroid. Just get the person started on ferrum fos. Help build the blood. A 6X, a couple times daily, ferrum iodatum, a couple times daily. Ferrum arsenicum is a wonderful adjunct. Graphites, calc sulf, cali sulf, all of these remedies are really strong adjuncts. And if you find yourself trying to decide, oh, I'm, you know, maybe one of these remedies is an option versus something else as I'm doing my differential, lean in these oxygenoid remedy differentials or a muriaticum, which is a big remedy for uterine fibroids and has a strong affinity for the liver, has a very strong affinity for the gonads. So when you're seeing thyroid dysfunction in combination with something like premature ovarian failure, this is gonna be a leader in your consideration. Um, thank you, Mita. There's a question here from Mita. Can ferrum fos be given along with at the same time as the chronic remedy? Um, not in the mouth at the same time, but let's say that you have somebody taking their LM daily, or you gave them a 200C single dose at the, you know, at the last consult, and now you've got a period of time before you see them again. You can ask them to take ferrum fos cell salts two or three times daily between now and next time. Or maybe they take their ferrum fos cell salts through the day and they take their LM dose at night. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, and all the iodums, iodum itself, calcarea iodatum, cali iodatum, arsenicum iodatum, sulfur iodatum. And I generally use potencies between 10X and 20X. A lot of times, depending on what the substance is, Boricky was usually using 3X to 5X. So clients are also likely to need an endocrine SAR code. If you're making improvement and the case stalls and all of a sudden you're not making improvement anymore, you can give a single dose of hypothalamus or anterior pituitary or thyroidinum and then follow up with an adjusted potency or a different adjunct. 
Now, I want to say, please be careful with high potencies of thyroidinum. You can really aggravate the snot out of somebody. And I've seen some really bad aggravations with thyroidinum 30C and 200C. So I'm very, very hesitant to give those remedies now. Okay, so let's talk. We've got a case. There's this client. She's never well since pregnancy. She's got during her pregnancy, she had severe, severe morning sickness. And uh, overall, she was healthy, athletic. Since the baby was born nine months ago, she's super tired, super, super tired. She had about four months with very high energy, maybe more than normal. She was nervous and jittery, but maybe it was because of being a new mama but now she's super tired. Okay, so this is the typical pattern of postpartum thyroiditis, where the thyroid goes into hyperfunction for a little while, maybe with palpitations, can't sleep, and it gets all mixed up with, oh, and I have a new baby, and I'm getting up in the middle of the night, and maybe I'm just worried, is my baby sleeping? Am I doing this right? And maybe not. And then after several months of hyper or even one month, two month, three months of hyper, then you go into hypo function and the mama's super tired. And again, it gets mixed up with new baby where people say, oh, well, of course you're tired. You have a new baby. But this is more than that. The other thing that she says is that I don't have any connection with the baby. I look at her and I think, well, I want to love you, but she doesn't feel anything. She's irritable, she's cranky, she doesn't want to be touched, she's picking fights with her husband. She was a professional woman and now she's staying home and she was very excited about, you know, being a mama and she hates it. She's losing hair, her skin is dry, she's gained 12 pounds in the last two months, her mom has a goiter, her maternal grandmother had thyroid problems. So what are we going to give her? We're going to give her some sepia. She has a disconnect with her baby. She has a hormonal disruption, hormonal disruption, never well since pregnancy and childbirth. And we're going to see what happens. So overall, she says, oh, I feel so happy. And I fell in love with my baby. And I still don't like being home. I kind of miss my career, but it's not really bothering me. And now I have energy to do things. Energy's back to normal for me. And I was so surprised. I even want to have sex with my husband. And I'm no longer cranky. I've lost seven pounds. I'm exercising and I'm doing yoga with my baby. And the hair loss and the dry skin isn't any different. And I had asked her to get labs to test her thyroid. And she is in a health management system, Kaiser, where the only test they will do is TSH. Now the TSH is actually a test showing what the pituitary is telling the thyroid to do, the thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not actually telling us what the thyroid itself is doing. So what do we do here? Well, she's had sepia, it's clearly acted, and she still has these indicators of hair loss, dry skin. Do we tinker around? Do we stay with the sepia? We give it a little bit more time. So overall, third follow-up, super happy now with my family life. I still miss work. I'm volunteering time in grown-up intellectual endeavors. I need to talk to somebody every day who hasn't drooled. And she's loving her baby now. Her energy is good. She's back to her pre-pregnancy weight and shape. Hair loss and dry skin has not changed. And she went to her nature path and paid out of pocket. And they tested for thyroid antibodies. And she got a diagnosis of postpartum thyroiditis. Her T3 and T4 are out of range. She's not in good shape. So, hmm. I try various different potencies of sepia. Eight months later, and this was, this was a case in 2006. So this was 14 years ago before I understood a lot of what I understand now. And she has had all over the next eight months, I added bioplasma 
which is a metabolite, and sometimes that can help. Um, I had her take, <coughs> excuse me, an adjunct called Sirius Seaweed Potion, which has seaweed and iodine and all kinds of good stuff in it. That didn't work. I gave her an intercurrent dose of sorinum. I gave her calc self cell salts. I gave her some remedies that follow well from sepia. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I gave her an intercurrent dose of anterior pituitary. <coughs> Excuse me, I gotta go get a drink of water. Kavita, now is a good time if you've got questions or anything else. I'll be back in a minute. <coughs> sure, Karen. Please, everyone put your questions in the chat and uh, we can discuss. And also in the chat, we have posted the FDA comment. So if you get a chance, please do um, click on that link and it will just take two minutes. And Karen is here. Sorry about that. I had a tickle in my throat. Okay, so um, I spent a lot of time messing around. Now we can ask a really valid question. Truly, if she was feeling better, she was happy, she loved her baby, why didn't we just leave it alone? Did we really need to chase the thyroid? This is a 34 year old woman. Where is this gonna be in five years or 10 years or 20 years? If we have the chance to clean it up now, I believe we're obligated to do that. So that's why I was, she was going along, still taking sepia occasionally, doing well. And I tried all these different things. And by the time we get eight months in, the hair loss is accelerating. She's losing more and more hair. The skin has become more and more dry and now she's got a lot of ridging on her fingernails. So the autoimmune aspect of the thyroid problem is progressing. So she's gotten better overall in her functional life, but the autoimmune problem is getting more. So we have to deal with that. So what do we do? We can't just leave it. <clears throat> so this was where I went back and began to do some research about really what does it mean to do work in a rising autoimmune terrain. This was not part of her life before the pregnancy. So when there has been a hormonal disruption, how do we resolve an emerging autoimmune terrain? And so I looked at some of this and I asked her, do you have problems with weather changes? And she says, absolutely. And she tells me all about that. And then I looked at what happens when somebody has problems with weather changes, and a constitution that is oxygenoid. And when I went back and looked at all of those other indicators that we went through earlier, all of those were part of her case. So I stopped working on things that had to do with the thyroid. I stopped worrying about the thyroid and I started engaging the immune system. I had her start taking Timuline, which is a remedy made from, this sounds weird, the squeezings of the thymus gland, ew. 
It is a SAR code from the thymus gland. And I had her start taking that and I had her start taking Ceanothus, which is an organ support for the spleen. And I had her start taking ferromyodotum. And she took one of these in the morning, one of them at lunchtime and one of them at dinner. And this was very on it early on in, in my um, work with this kind of stuff. And I have to say, I was not taught this in anything that I went to school with. And had I turned in a case like this in school, I'd have got my hand slapped because this thing of working in the autoimmune realm with multiple adjunct remedies. This was common when Boraki was practicing, but it was not common in the way that I was taught to practice. And I felt guilty, like I was doing something wrong. And so I really had to make peace. I was experimenting based on reading Burnett and Farrington and Fubister and reading all these old homeopaths because I could see the autoimmune condition progressing in this woman. Now, the case still looked like sepia, but sepia wasn't solving it. And it, we always have that idea that maybe we could find a deeper, better remedy. Maybe. But in my way of doing this, this was what I did. <clears throat> oh, and the result immediately, within 10 days, her hair stopped falling out and started growing in. Her skin stopped being dry and became normal. The ridges on her fingernails went away and she went back after three months and tested again, completely normal, no antibodies, all of her thyroid function in normal range. Okay, so <clears throat> in summary, here are things that you can think about. When you have somebody who's dealing with thyroid function, which can be from a hormonal insult, from an autoimmune point of view, from a head injury, from all kinds of things, if they get good result from a chronic constitutional remedy, then you did it. If they're not getting good result from a chronic constitutional remedy, look at the remedies that are associated with oxygenoid constitution and lean in that direction. Look at remedies that for, for anybody who's tested positive for thyroid antibodies, look at remedies with an immune system affinity. And if you find a good chronic remedy for them that doesn't have this affinity, you shouldn't be surprised when the client improves overall, but the autoimmune issue does not. <laughs> Help the spleen, support the spleen, consider organ support from the spleen. Ceanothus 3X, Natmir cell salts, hornbeam gemotherapy. These are all adjuncts that can be done along with chronic care. The use of timuline, and many people are using this right now during the pandemic. Uh, the halides, focus on the iodine salts as good organ support. And then consider the best indicated intercurrent nosode, uh, carcinosin cumcuprum, serinum, um, is both of those are great for autoimmune, basilinum is also another one. Now Burnett gave basilinum every 10th day. He had people taking whatever their chronic remedy was, days one through nine, and then on the 10th day, he would have them take the intercurrent nosode. So all of these are good options for you. Okay, are there questions? Three X. Um, is it applicable? Will it not be a pathological dosage? Oh, that's a great question. So I would not give 3X of, say, lachesis, because that's a toxic poison. 
but a 3x of calc carb of calc iodatum that is not toxic that's tonic we're actually kind of in that realm that's halfway between a remedy and a nutritional supplement that's where these cell salts and organ support potencies live thank you that's a good question does it matter what time of day to give Sometimes it does because if you give calcarea iodatum or you know some of those iodum salts just before bed, sometimes that person's lying there in bed all night going, gosh, I wish I could sleep. So early in the morning is a good time for some of those. Yeah, thank you. Victoria's put, um, when you've got multiple different ones daily, I don't think it makes very much difference. But you, it helps if you, you know, you can just say to the client, pick a time for each of these and take them. But in my experience, clients like it better when you say, take this first thing in the morning, take this midday, take this long time. And honestly, guys, have you ever had a protocol where you had to take something three times a day or four times a day? It's a huge bother. And then you get to where you forget. You're like, I remember taking that. Was that yesterday or was that this morning? Did I take that? Did I not take it? So reassure them this is not forever. This is for like two weeks and you should see a response, big response within two weeks or you need to find a different therapeutic. Other questions? You're on mute. Can you unmute? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have one more question from Dr. Meeta. Uh, is it, uh, can forum, forum force be given along with at the same time as a chronic remedy? Absolutely. When you have, uh, and I know that there are some people who do not teach this and would never do this. So I don't wanna you know, upset anybody's apple cart, but I can say for me, almost everybody that I work with has a chronic remedy that is doing what it can do, the best match that I can find and some kind of organ support. And in this example, the timuline or the ceanothus or the ferromyodotum, those would be an organ support. And so the remedy being given as the chronic might be one single dose. You know, I see the person in the consult, I give them a dose of 200C or 1M. And then I ask them to take ferrum FOSS daily between now or twice daily between now and when I see them again. Or they might be on an LM potency and they're take, or a daily dose of 12C of whatever their remedy is. And so I just have them take their adjunct at a different time of day. Okay, is so there any? Uh, no other questions. Very beautiful presentations from your side. Thank you for sharing this excellent webinar, ma'am. And uh, we have with us Dr. Kavita. I yes. Um, what to you, ma'am? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Karen. It was a wonderful presentation. Actually, you know, it was heavily raining and I lost the internet, but I'm able to manage it. So things will happen. And so um, thank you so much, uh, Karen, again, and uh, learned many new things, though treated several uh, difficult thyroid cases with successful result. But today's session is very helpful with the agents and oxygenite constitutions and many more. And we will take questions from uh, Professor uh, Regina and Dr. Sveta will take questions from chat. Oh, okay, we went, we went through some questions. I think we're ready now to have Sheetal talk with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera and, and step and into the background, but I really wanna hear what Sheetal <laughs> has to say. Yes, and before you, uh, we would like to honor your gracious presence, Karen, with a certificate from our car study group. Please kindly accept. And thank you so much, uh, Karen, for being with us in spite of your busy schedule. And um, it's a great honor, and we would definitely have you again with us. Thank you, thank you. That's very lovely. And 
Yeah. So Dr. Sheetal Tiwari, she completed her BHMS and she's a, um, our new CHC president and she graduated in homeopathic medicine first in class from the University of Maharashtra, India in 2011. She has near a decade of clinical experience. Dr. Sheetal has been a student of Dr. Farooq Master and her classical homeopathic practice is in Cleveland, Ohio. She also has training in traditional yogic practice. And today she will share more about the importance of CHC, uh, getting CHC certified. Please, Sheetal, and I'm so sorry, I cannot share from my end PowerPoint. Yeah. I will share then. Thank yes. you so much, Kavita, for the introduction. And Karen, it was such a fabulous learning experience. So I'm here to represent CHC. And uh, so who we are? The Council of Homeopathic Certification is the nationally recognized organization for certifying classical homeopaths in the United States and Canada. We provide the most prestigious credentials for homeopaths, that is the CCH. With, so who we are, so the Council of Homeopathic Certification is the nationally recognized homeopathic, nationally recognized organization for certifying classical homeopaths in the United States and Canada. We provide the most prestigious credentials for homeopaths, that is the CCH, which stands for Certified Classical Homeopath. It is the gold standard for homeopaths practicing all over North America. So CHC was founded in 1991 and is a nonprofit organization managed by a board of directors who are representative of diverse homeopathic community they serve. And our mission is to advance the homeopathic profession by certifying individuals who meet and maintain a recognized standard for professional and ethical competency in classical homeopathy. We also assist the general public in choosing appropriately qualified homeopaths. So now what makes CCH designation the gold standard in North America? So it is that in 2017, the CCH was accredited by the National Commission for Certifying Agencies, making it the only nationally accredited homeopathy certifying organization in North America. And our organization is proud and feels honored to achieve this milestone in the history of the homeopathic profession. NCC validation of expertise and standards equates homeopathy with other healthcare professions. And it, it is now that CHC has joined the elite group of NCCA accredited organization and is widely recognized by policymakers and healthcare officials. So this NCCA accreditation is the first step towards making homeopathy the top of mind alternative modality. So now what does, what does the CHC do? We certify, we administer, CHC administers and maintains an entry level competency and maintains homeopathy profession standards which are developed by the classical homeopathy stakeholders. We also recertify our candidate. We can, it, CHC conducts recertifications to build knowledge beyond entry level. So CHC, the eligibility criteria for taking the exam is 500 hours of homeopathic education, 500 hours of homeopathic clinical training, college level anatomy and physiology and human uh, pathology courses. And the education and training must be in form of Achina accredited and uh, or should be approved and is eligible for CHO approval. So the most exciting information which I wanted to share today is that more recently, the North America residency requirement for taking the exam was lifted. And now any eligible homeopath, no matter their country of residence, can take the CHC certification exam at the testing center located in the United States or Canada. So the practitioners who are outside, who, whose ed practitioners educated outside US and Canada must have their transcripts evaluated by a third party education evaluation firm 
prior to applying for the exam. So if you are a CCH and resonate with the idea of advocating for a credential, please join our PR team and or other committees. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter for all our latest updates. And if you have any questions, please contact our office at chcinfo at the rate homeopathicdirectory.com or you can send an email directly to me at chcpress at the rate homeopathicdirectory.com. I would love to hear from you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kavita, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sheetal, for being here. Because so in all our webinars, we are just talking about CHC, get certified, get certified, and all related topics. But today, with your presence, your thoughts, it really made a big difference in all the viewers that how important to hear from you, from your perspective. And... Um, any more questions, we will definitely convey to you, um, Sheetal. It was very nice. And as we already told in our car introduction about CHC is already presented. And we will also have this recording for people to learn more from different countries internationally and globally getting associated with the CHC in USA and uh, get certified with all the questions they have. We can help them. Thank you. And uh, Professor Regina and Dr. Sveta, would you like to, or anyone in the chat, would you have any questions, please? It's been a blast being able to hear from Karen and from Sheetal about the CHC. And we learned so much from the thyroid disorders. That's been a blast to our lives. And we'll share through our community and our homeopathy work for society. Thank you for this great opportunity. Many blessings to you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, Jan was asking this question. Sweta, I don't know if it was already asked. She was saying that uh, any use with seaweed or kelp remedies, uh, better to go with the uh, straight halides. This is for Karen. So Jan from CHC. Uh, so she was saying that this was her question. Right. I have used seaweed and kelp uh, formulas, and I've had people add dulse granules. Sometimes... It seems like a nutritional issue when there are people who it's not so much that their metabolism is disrupted. Um, and some people just don't have very good diets. And in those cases, I think it's a beautiful adjunct that helps. But when you have people who have an autoimmune issue, like they've tested positive for Hashimoto's or they've got broader indicators, of autoimmune, then I think you absolutely need the halides. And that's when you're not really looking at a nutritional benefit from the gross product. You're really looking at, um, you know, a, a iodum salt or something like that in 6X or 12X potency. Does that help? Thank you so much, you were telling. Thank you so much, Karen <laughs> and everyone. So. Yeah, one more question, ma'am, uh, from Dr. Hira, Hira Lal Agarwal. Uh, any cause that points for the increasing cases of hypo and hyperthyroid on the globe? You know, that is a really interesting question. And I have thought about that a lot. And, you know, I think that the most likely reason has to do with toxicity and autoimmune because the fundamental nutrition issue isn't different now than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Now, another possibility is that it's not actually increasing. It's the same as it has been for decades and centuries, 
But now because we're testing more, we have more visibility. And so it looks like it's more, but it's not actually. Yeah, those, those would be my thoughts. So we have a couple of other questions in the comments. Um, is low thyroid subsequent to, if low thyroid subsequent to radiation treatment, radium bromatum is an excellent adjunct for that. In, and again, that's not one that you can use in a 3X potency, you know, because it's a pretty gnarly remedy in low potency. So I would be giving that like in a 12C or a 14C daily. I'm not sure that you can buy it in less than a like 14C. And then there's another question, can it be related to EMF exposure? Thank you, Susan, that's a great question. And the truth is I don't think we know enough yet. It could very well be because we know that there are some people who are very sensitive. And the thing that makes me think that there are people where the primary disturbance is EMF is that there are people where the primary resolution is an imponderable. And if, you know, all the imponderables are just a wave form and some waves cancel out other waves. So that would be my, my thoughts on that. But truly we're, you know, it's not like we've got decades and decades of deep experience on large populations with controlled studies to be able to tell. I mean, right now we're pretty much in the idea of, I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Um, in case of sepia chronic, something came out on the skin. In that case, could a mother tincture be used? A mother tincture of the sepia? I've never, I've never done that. So I don't know, that would be a good, that I would need to defer that question to somebody else who had experience with that. I haven't, I did not give that. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Blessings to Kavitha and thank you for all of you. And just uh, two minutes, uh, Karen. And we would also like to honor Dr. Sheetal for her gracious presence today. And Dr. Sweta Singh, uh, would you like to present the certificate, please? Thank you so much for both of you for your precious time. And thank you to all the audience for the precious time and undivided attention. Here you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kavita. And thank you, Karen. Okay. So I would like to announce uh, uh, upcoming events. On December 6th, uh, same time at 9 p.m. India and 10.30 a.m. Eastern, we have two great speakers, Dennis Strages and Alistair Gray, who speaks on topic, COVID-19 has changed the world. Does it change the way we practice homeopathy? So it is a very... Another interesting topic because we are bringing many uh, webinars on COVID. Hope it helps everyone. And I uh, thank Ka Homeopathy Steady Group entire team for the continuous support. We have many more volunteers who have joined us today and we appreciate everyone's presence. And before we wrap up, Professor Regina and Dr. Sveta, would you like to say anything? Thank you, ma'am. Uh... First of all, uh, very happy Diwali to all of you, all of our viewers and all. Uh, you can follow our social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn uh, with the name Ka Homeopathy Study Group. Then you can follow our uh, YouTube channel with the name Kavita Kuknur uh, to watch all the videos uh, or, of, uh, or of our webinars and you can reach us uh, at kastudygroup at gmail.com and thank you all for joining us and get in touch. We are, uh, we are getting more, a lot more information, a lot more interesting webinars for you. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavita, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Sveta and uh, Professor Regina for moderating today's webinar and entire team. And do not forget whoever needs to get this HNA credit, please do fill the evaluation form 
and we will send the certificates as soon as possible. And for those who are on the Facebook, do email us castadgroup at gmail.com today. And do not forget to fill sign the FDA petition. Thank you again so much for Karen and Dr. Sheetal for being here with us and everyone. Until then, stay healthy and happy. Shubh Deepavali. Cheers. Happy.